Hey, hi. how's everybody doing in Chem 1110? This is going to be our, our first lecture type of video. I did do a syllabus and an introductory video as part one of our first lecture. Let's consider this part two. And as I said in my first uh, uh, video, I'm oftentimes going to do two parts because I think about 20 minutes to a half an hour is really the a good time interval for video. So with all said due, let's let's move into what we're going to be discussing today. Uh, on the on the dry erase board here, I have written down your first homework assignment is due on September 3rd, 2020. That's a couple weeks away. And it's offered through my lab mastering. So make sure you go in and get your access and register for it as soon as possible. And the first Homework assignment will cover Chapter E. The topics that we'll be covering today and Wednesday are involved in Chapter E, and we'll be doing it Friday also. I also have my email address. If you have any questions, that can be found on the syllabus also. It's posted up here. So when we uh, the topics that we're going to begin with in terms of lecture material, and I, what I mean by lecture material is graded material that you might see on an exam, we're going to begin... In chapter E, which is E stands for essentials. Uh, if you look at the PowerPoint I prepared, I have several of the topics that we'll be covering, we're going to focus on. And the, the topics that we're going to focus on in, in E2 involve the units of measurement. And we're going to also look at some topics in Appendix 1, which deal with scientific notation. Uh, Wednesday, I plan on doing a, a lecture, a two-part lecture, on the reliability of a measurement. And this involves significant figures. Uh, and also the use of significant figures in mathematical calculations. And we'll also introduce density, which is a topic I believe that they're covering in lab. Uh, Friday, we're going to spend a lot of time on problem solving, converting between units, uh, problem-solving strategies, and also using equations where we place numbers into an, an equation based upon some values that we're given for them. So let's begin with section E2. Section E2 is units or the units of measurement, as we call them. And I posted my first PowerPoint page as main concepts. So I, I like to throw some things at you that we're trying to focus on. What we're going to look at in this section are our four SI base units, and we'll discuss why they're base units and how we derive other units from these base units. Uh, and we're also going to do some, a simple problem today, which is a warm-up exercise just to make sure you're using your calculator correctly, and that's conversions between temperature scales. And then we're going to end today's topic by discussing how to place numbers into scientific or exponential notation. So let, let's begin with chemistry, what we do. I'm a chemist. Some of you might be becoming chemists later in your, in your career. Uh, chemists study matter in the changes that it undergoes. And oftentimes we conduct these studies in the laboratory and we have a lab notebook and we write down some observations in our, in our studies that we're conducting. Now, the observations that we make may either be qualitative or quantitative. And I, I wrote up just some, a, a brief description of what this information is. Qualitative information is descriptive. We might say that we're heating a beaker and the water in the beaker gets warmer, it gets hotter. Or, our information might be quantitative, and this is measurable information. If we boil some water, we might find that its final temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. And that's some data that we would need to record, and we would use that as, as a measurable piece of data that we, that we would require maybe later on. Now, notice when I said the temperature was 100 degrees Celsius. It's important when we're using measurable data, quantitative information, our data has to have units. Otherwise, that information is going to be useless. 
I gave a simple example of maybe something you're common, you might be familiar with. I, I'm sure a lot of people, if not all of you, know Tom Brady. I mean, I, I think he's still playing. I think he went to Tampa Bay. Uh, now, to say Tom Bay, if we wanted to know what Tom Brady weighed, it's kind of useless if I said Tom Brady's 100. He weighs 100. 100 what? Okay, 100 pounds? Now, Tom Brady's a pretty big guy. Tom Brady doesn't weigh 100 pounds. He weighs 100 kilograms or approximately 100 kilograms, which is roughly 225 pounds. So it's important when we report data that we have units associated with it so that the people that we're expressing this data to knows what it means and can use it for further applications. Uh, that was a simple example of the improper reporting of data. Tom Brady weighs 100. Might not be that important to anybody but a football fan, if you're from New England even, or now Tampa Bay. But I actually have posted where the improper reporting of units in your data resulted in a loss of money. Luckily, no loss of life. It was a disaster. Uh, in 1999, NASA had a, uh, a Mars climate orbiter that was orbiting Mars, collecting data. And unfortunately, engineers improperly reported and interpreted data, and it resulted in the crashing of the uh, Mars orbiter, and it resulted in $125 million loss of money. Fortunately, no loss of life. But this is just an example of what could happen if you don't report data with the proper units. There's some confusion, and we want to prevent that, and we want to learn about how we report units in, a, in, a, in our laboratory, in chemistry, and how we would report them in the real world if we move on, along in our life and uh, move into the uh, real sector of conducting experiments in, in a laboratory. Now, there are three common uh, systems of measurement that most of us are familiar with. As Americans, we're familiar with the English system of measurement. Uh, we, we might know that if we measure distance, it might be in feet, might be in miles. Uh, we also, probably are familiar with the metric system. Uh, you might know that uh, you go to the Olympics, there's the 100 meter dash now. That's enough, that's going, we don't have the Olympics this year, but the 100 meter dash is a distance that's listed in metric units. That's another unit that we're familiar with of measurement. In, in science, we, we use a system that's related to the metric system. We'll be learning about the metric prefixes. We use the international system of units. This is sometimes called the SI system, system international. I believe it's, it's the French terminology for it. Uh, and the international system of units are what we're gonna be focusing on in our course as we move through the first section. Now, in terms of the SI system, we have base units. Let's write down what these base units are. SI base units. Base units, we call them base units because we're gonna learn later on, maybe in the, our lecture on Wednesday, that base units are used to derive other units. And we're gonna be discussing a base unit of length and how we derive another unit, a derived unit of volume. And we'll go over that on Wednesday. Let's list some of our base units. Now in the SI system, We have mass, and the unit that we use for mass is the kilogram. I'm underlining kilo because that's a metric prefix that we're going to learn more about. 
We also have a unit of length. And its unit is the meter. And we have a base time. And the unit that we use is the second. Temperature. In science, the unit that we use to report temperature is the Kelvin. These are the four that we're going to focus on today. A little bit later, probably in chapter, end of chapter one, we're going to look at another, another unit that we use that represents the amount of a substance. And I'll list it now. And we're going to spend a lot of time on this later in the semester. Mole. We'll be using the mole and the mole concept a lot as we move through uh, this course. Now, time, we're all familiar with time, the second, and we're probably familiar with how we can convert seconds to minutes to hours to days and so forth. So since we're so familiar with that, we're not going to spend much time on, on we're not going to spend much time on time. Pretty cool, huh? Length, meter, well, a meter, we're probably more familiar with the yard. A meter is just a little longer than it. It's, it's actually slightly less than a yard, just slightly less than a yard. Now, mass, kilogram. Okay, we usually use weight when we talk about the size of somebody. Remember, I just talked about Tom Brady, and I said, he weighs roughly 225 pounds, which is roughly 100 kilograms. But there is a, a subtle difference between, maybe not subtle, but there is a difference between mass and weight. Weight is the force that gravity pulls upon a body. Mass is the amount of matter within uh, a substance. So the issue about them, weight, weight, uh, that we use pounds, it depends upon where you're making the measurement at. Mass is what we use in science because it's independent of the location. Now, what we're going to show later is that there is a conversion factor between weight and mass, the pound and the kilogram or the gram. And that's because under certain conditions, if we have a certain defined condition, we can convert between mass and weight, and we'll define that a little bit later. What we're going to focus on in our first section, and as I said, we're going to do a simple exercise just to make sure we're using our calculator correctly. So we're going to look at temperature, temperature scale. Now in the SI system, we're going to use the Kelvin. Now in the United States, we're familiar with Fahrenheit. Most other countries, most other foreign countries, use Celsius. Kelvin is what we use in science. Now, Kelvin is, is an absolute scale. We're going to learn more about it when we get into the gas section. It's an absolute scale, and it's related to uh, thermal motion of particles. And there's no negative value for Kelvin. So that's what's important about it. Uh, we, there's, there, we're approaching a zero point at Kelvin, but it's really hard to attain absolute zero, zero Kelvin, because it's really hard to get a situation in which there's no motion of particles. Again, that's a thermodynamic discussion. You'll learn more about if you take chem 1120. What we want to talk about, though, are the different conversion uh, equations that would be given to you and have available to you on an exam. And let's talk about how we can convert between our three temperature scales. We have an equation that relates Fahrenheit and Celsius. Fahrenheit is equal to 1.8 degrees Celsius plus 32. 
we could rearrange this equation and we could relate Celsius to Fahrenheit. Celsius is equal to the temperature that we have present minus 32 divided by 1.8. And so these two equations, again, they would be given to us. These are conversion equations for Celsius and Fahrenheit. Kelvin, well, generally we give you the relationship between Kelvin and Celsius. Kelvin is equal to the temperature that you're given in Celsius plus 273.15. And we're going to learn about where this number comes from in Chapter 10 when we discuss gases. So these are our temperature conversion equations. And as a first exercise, we're simply going to go into an application on how we would use these equations in an exam setting or in a real world application. So this is a practical application and there's actually another example in your textbook. And I have this posted on the PowerPoint. Example E1 on page six in your book. Good reference for going through this problem. Again, they go through a step-by-step -step problem solving strategy and then they ask you another one afterwards to apply the strategy. Let's look at our, our, our problem that I have listed on today's PowerPoint. So this is a practical application. An instrument in the laboratory requires your temperature to be input. So we can think of we're going into the laboratory and we have an instrument and we usually have a computer with the, uh, associated with the instrument. And that instrument requires us to enter the temperature because the engineers designed it to have the temperature reported in Kelvin. And you walk into the to lab that day and you look at your thermometer that was put there by the building architects and they're from America and that thermometer says 70 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what's given to us. I'm going to write it completely how it's written in the book on our question. Let's write down what's given to us. And this is really common how I solve problems. I look at what's given, all the other information, a lot of words, but really focus on what, what's given to you. And also focus on another important aspect of a question, a word problem, what you desire. We desire a temperature in Kelvin. So when you're given a problem, a word problem, you have to know what's given to you and you have to know where you're going to take that to, to get what you want. You need to know what's desired. So let's think of a strategy to solve this problem. We're given our temperature in Fahrenheit and we're desiring a temperature in Kelvin. And we look at our temperature conversion equations that we're working with. And we have to think of a strategy to solve the problem. So let's think. At the end of the day, we want to calculate Kelvin. So that equation is going to be very important. We're going to need our, our, our temperature in Kelvin. And to get to Kelvin, we need to know what our temperature is in Celsius. But what we're given is our temperature in Fahrenheit. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this equation also. Let's forget about this one for the time being. And these are our problem-solving strategies, using the equations that are given to us in a logical manner. So first thing we're going to do is calculate our temperature in degrees Celsius by using our given temperature in Fahrenheit and plugging it into this equation. So let's erase Fahrenheit. And let's plug in 70 degrees. And 
And now I, we're going to make sure that you're using your calculator properly. I know a lot of you are probably like, I could do this. I did this before in high school. I just want to make sure if you have a calculator, you know how to use it and you're not making any mistakes. And we'll review a little bit about order of operations. 70 minus 32, we're going to work within our brackets. And we're going to get an intermediate answer. This is going to be 70 minus 32 is 38. And now we're going to plug 38 divided by 1.8. And you're going to get a number on your calculator, 21.1111. And the ones are going to continue. So what we're going to learn as we go through our significant figure section, and this will be more detail on it on Wednesday, we're going to take data from an intermediate step and we're going to use all the data that we have available to us. We're not going to round during an intermediate step. We're going to use this number that we have for our temperature in Celsius and plug it into our Kelvin equation. And we're going to add it to 273.15. Now, on this problem, I'm specifically asking to give a final answer with three significant figures. So if we add these two together, we're going to end up with 294.2611. Okay, there's probably going to be some more ones down there. And we're just going to report it as 294 Kelvin. As I said, we're gonna learn specific rules for applying significant figures a little bit later. Probably on Wednesday will be a topic that we'll be discussing uh, significant figures and calculations involving significant figures. This is just a problem to make sure that you're using your calculator properly. If you have any issues with this calculation that we've done here, send me an email, let me know and we'll go through it and review the problem in your textbook that I suggested. Now, the, the SI units that we're going to be using, they do use metric prefixes, and we'll learn more about metric prefixes on Wednesday also. But to use metric prefixes, we have to review the use of scientific notation how we put numbers into proper scientific notation. Scientific notation is oftentimes also referred to as exponential notation, and it's covered in Appendix 1 of your textbook. And I do review it a little bit just so... People that haven't seen it aren't uh, feeling like left out. So I want to make sure that we're, we're all up to base on how to write scientific notation. So when we think of what scientific notation is, it's placing a number, whether it be very large or very small, in a notation such that it's written as N times x to the wyth power. Now, n, n is going to be a number between 1 and 10. Actually, 1 and 9 is proper. And y is going to be an exponent. We'll keep it as 10 because it's between 1 and 10. And y is an exponent.
and the exponent y, it depends upon how we move a decimal when we're dealing with very large or small numbers. We're going to go over a few rules and how we write scientific notation. The first one is we're going to look at numbers that are greater than one. When a number is greater than one, we move the decimal to the left to give us a positive num expon exponent, and the number of positions will give us the, number, the value of y, and n will be a number, as I said, between 1 and 10. Let's do a couple of examples of writing numbers in scientific notation. Two forty-five. Notice there's no decimal written with two forty-five. So what we do is we imagine there would be a decimal right past the five, and we're going to write this number in scientific notation. Move the decimal one, two places, and that gives us a number now between one and ten and we raise it to a power of two. Now, normally when it's a positive power, we don't write the positive, but if you wrote a positive, I wouldn't have a heart attack. I'm okay with it. Computers might not like it. So I don't want to encourage you to write a positive. We would just simply write it as 10 raised to the second power. Good, let's try another number. 12,000, that's 12,320. Let's write this number in scientific notation. One, two, three. We move our decimal four places. And that would be the new number that we've written. Notice. This represents the same value of that number, but we're raising it to a power of four, and that's reflected in how we move our decimal. And also notice the number of digits I've retained. Again, this is gonna be a topic that we're gonna be covering when we discuss writing numbers and identifying science, uh, significant figures. Let's try one more. So do this one on your own, okay? And we'll get back to that as a review at the beginning of our next lecture. Try this one on your own. Now for numbers smaller than one, what we do is we move the decimal to the right position and now we have a negative exponent. Let's go through a few examples. Let's try the harder, harder of these ones. Well, let's, let's just start with the first one. Now, let's write this number in scientific notation. We move the decimal one position to the right. We now have a number between one and 10. And we moved our decimal one position to the right. And we do use negative numbers to represent the movement of the decimal to make a number less than one now between one and 10. And that would be 10 to the negative first. Zero point zero 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 eight oh nine. Let's write this in scientific notation to move our decimal one, two, three, four. 
8.09 times 10 to the negative fourth. So another important aspect of this is notice when we move our decimal with these zeros, we, we drop off. We don't report them. Again, when we start addressing significant figures, we're going to learn that these zeros that are to the, to, to the left out here, they mark our decimal position, and they're not significant. When we write it in scientific notation, well, what we're going to learn on Wednesday is that's a nice way to represent a number in the proper number of significant figures. And that helps us sometimes if we're making a decision on how many significant figures to report. So we're going to finish. That's it. 30 minutes. That's what I wanted to do. We'll pick up with metric prefixes and going through significant figures on Wednesday's lecture. Hey, good luck. Wash your hands and have a good day.